And we are rolling okay. on April 2nd <laughs> with Josh Martin, who's about to talk about opening government. Um, so, yeah, so especially at nationals, they're going to do the, you know, eight rounds, which means you're, like, guaranteed opening government twice, which could, uh, especially if you guys are, say you're on the cusp of breaking or not breaking, you know, like, two opening govs, if you don't do well and you pick up, like, two-fourths, then that, like, kill the entire tournament for you, even if you do well in every other position, you know, so I think, and I think that opening up is probably the position most people are scared of. Um, so one, one thing to think of on that note is, you know, if we could just avoid fourths and, and hopefully thirds in opening government, you don't even need to necessarily get the one, right, um, to, to, to break, right, um, and until you're in the final, you don't need to get the first at all, you can just go seconds through the whole tournament, right, so if you can get, like, twos in opening gov and then win the other positions, you're going to be solid. So, um... What this is, is it's kind of, you know, I don't like to coach super formulaic. This is super formulaic, but it's more that you guys have it as a starting point. Um, just considering, like, I'm here uh, a, less than a week before you're going to be debating, there's not too much that you could, like, learn how to think, if that makes sense. So formula might be the most useful thing for you guys, at least as a starting point. If you want to manipulate this in rounds, um, then cool. Does that, does that make sense? I know it's super, like, ethereal right now, but anyway. Okay, so... Um, a couple general comments on opening government. I'm going to put up um, the things that you want to attack, that you want to tackle, um, and then you're going to have to make some decisions here. And in general, um, if you make your decisions based on what's going to make the debate better, uh, that, that's going to be the best way forward. So the alternative to that would be making a decision based on what you think would make it easier for you to win the debate. Okay, you don't want to choose what would make it easier for you to win the debate. You want to choose what would make it easier to make what would make the debate as a whole better, okay? Which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but if you make it easier on yourself, generally what that means is that you're limiting the scope of the debate and you're hiding from arguments, uh, which is going to make the whole debate garbage. The arguments are going to get really nitpicky about well, what about this? What about that? Why did you include this thing? Why did you not include that thing? It's going to be a really semantic debate, and at the end of that, the judge like A is going to have a really shitty hour. Um, and at the end of that shitty hour, they're going to blame it on you, right? So um, at the end, yeah, so you want, the, you want to, if you set up a good debate, even if at the end of it you don't necessarily win the debate, you can still even get the first in this format because they do give you the benefit of doubt of being the first team to speak. Does that make sense? So if the judge is like, that was an awesome debate, and credits you with being the origin of that awesome debate, that's going to gain you more traction ranking-wise than winning these tiny little arguments that set up a really bad debate that was kind of muddled and confused and semantic. Okay, so keep that in mind. And sometimes I know it, it feels um, good to hide, you know, some of the comments you guys were making, like we're worried about this argument, so we set it up in this way to hide from that argument, right? But then you're cutting out huge sections of the debate instead of um, broadening the debate and making it uh, just a better conversation in general. So keep that in mind. Um, another thing that can help you just, um, I guess, emotionally with opening government is you feel like you're putting up your case to be just torn down by everybody else. Um, that's the wrong way to approach it. Generally, what I like to think is I like to think of the status quo as a team that's spoken before me. Okay, so everybody would rather attack something rather than defend something. Is that fair? Um, and if you can use the status quo as somebody that has given a speech before you got up as the prime minister and you're attacking the status quo, you're being offensive towards the status quo rather than defensive, um, a lot of people just, I guess, emotionally seem to like approaching the position better in that way. Okay, so you feel like you're doing damage to something rather than just like, here's my speech, now everybody just talk shit on me for an hour. Okay, so um, identifying what the status quo is, and I'm going to go over this more in detail later, but identifying what the status quo is and attacking the status quo, pointing out the problems so that you're doing something to somebody um, is a good way of approaching opening government too, that um, makes you feel uh, better about yourself. Everybody feels better about themselves when they're making fun of somebody else. Um, rather than being made fun of. Okay? Um, and then the last thing here strategically is that uh, you need to defend your side of the motion. So, like, one of the trends in debate has been to just see, like, who could be more liberal. Uh, so the Syrian refugee um, motion is a good example. Um, I, I, a lot of the arguments are really weak on the, the way that it was worded. was, like, made it weird. But So the government side was anti-Syrian refugees coming into the country. Um, and instead of, you know, intuitively that side would be on the side of, you know, the existing domestic culture, you know, the people that are already in the country, um, rather than the refugees. 
but everybody's scared to defend the, that group of people, or if it's a motion that makes you defend corporations versus workers. Um, so everybody comes up with really weak arguments to try and find a cute way of defending the worker rather than debating um, where you're defending the side of the motion that you've been placed on. Does that make sense? So you have strong argumentation that isn't liberal, so you feel dirty saying it, but that's the, that's the strong argumentation, right? That's clear, it's, it's intuitive, um, it's what you're supposed to be defending, um, and instead they come up with these, like, you know, if, if we take, like, three logical links to get to this other thing, then maybe we can find a way to defend this group over here. It's very difficult to be an opposition side who's been given the position to defend that group directly when you have to take that many steps to be able to defend them. Does that make sense? Um, again, it's, it's a little bit ethereal, but I think, like, um, yeah, the Syrian motion might give you a good, like, they, they're just straight up defending the Syrian people. Right? And you're trying to find cute ways of defending the Syrian people. So um, what we were talking about in your speech, um, one of the comments I think is uh, when the question to you, like, isn't it better to, that they're not dying compared to like they're not getting paid a whole lot? Right? So there's a really good example of you're trying to find ways to say, like, well, they're going to think less of themselves. And maybe if they think less of themselves and they buy into this bifurcated narrative, then that's going to have some sort of impact, like psychological impact, and that might play out in some way that's going to give them a lower position in society later. Like you're jumping through all these hoops on your side because you don't want to defend the side you've been given, but you're trying to find clever ways of defending the side that opposition was given. I, I'm, I'm not like, trying to pick on you, it's just not really yeah, yeah. a speech side. You know, versus opposition can say like, they are dying, done. Right, so you know, you need to be an infinitely better debater to defend, to, to beat somebody when you give yourself a handicap like that. Okay, so all these things are kind of just um, the mindset that you approach opening government with, right? Uh, are you willing to um, take a risk? Are you willing to be offensive about it rather than hyper-defensive about it? Are you willing to open up the debate and leave yourself open to attack, but then make the debate better rather than trying to close off the debate and making the debate worse, okay? Um, and I think that, like, the best analogy is if you are doing gymnastics, like a floor routine, I'm big, or ice skating, I'm big into ice, just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, you, you have a, the potential, or okay, this will make me sound way manlier. The uh, NBA, the dunk contest, the slam dunk contest, all right? So you've got a dunk, and it's got like the potential of 10, right? You're going to like flip over, jump on a horse, and the j horse is going to jump over the basket, and then you're going to like jump off the horse, and you're going to slam dunk the ball, right? And if you do that, you, you get like a 12 out of 10, you know, versus a guy that's just going to stand there and dunk, and if he gets it right, he gets like, if he, if he does it perfectly, he can only get a 5. Does that make sense? So it's the same thing in opening government. When you challenge yourself to make tougher decisions and go bigger, the judges are going to appreciate that. All right? So you're making, you're, you're, you're taking the bull by the horns, if you will, really going after it, and then the judge is like, he's going for the 12. He didn't get it perfect, but we're still going to give him the 9 for it. Versus the team that tries to like hide from everything. He's like, yeah, you got a 7 out of 7, good for you. you know, but it, it wasn't really that good. So um, like as a judge... Um, they're seriously sitting in the back of the room like, oh my god, this is so boring. You know, versus like, oh, this is really interesting. And that, whether they want to admit it or not, that totally plays into the rankings that they give at the end of the round. Okay? Um, Alright. All that makes sense? Okay, so super um, theoretical. Um, I'll get more practical now. You'll like this stuff better. Okay, so here's the things that you need to do when you're putting together a um, Prime Minister's speech. Like, you know, the Prime Minister's job is to define the debate. Right? These are the things that go into defining the debate, and if you cover these things, you're, and you do, if you do this decently, you're almost guaranteed to get like a second, unless you're in an amazing room. So if you're in like a normal room, um, this will get you in the top half of the house if you do these things functionally. Okay? So the first thing you're going to need to do, I'll write them all down first, then we can talk about it. First thing you need is the definition. Second thing you need is problem goal. Philosophy, point of controversy. Sorry if my writing is not good enough. This says motion specific. So, everybody got that so far? So these are the things you want to cover in a Prime Minister's speech as you set up the debate. Okay? First thing is definition. Definition doesn't necessarily mean you're defining the terms. 
Um, the term that I prefer for definition, I'm going to use a different color. This <laughs> This is going to add to the content. Um, the first thing, the, def, uh, the term I like to use is contextualize. So it would be contextualization. Yeah, so when you contextualize a topic, you're not necessarily defining the words, but you're making sure that everybody knows exactly what it is that you're talking about. Okay, so um, I've got a whole bunch of motions here. If it was um, a prohibitive tax on car ownership, it was the, was the motion. You could get up and you can define, like, this is what a prohibitive tax is, this is what car ownership is, definitionally. But you're still not necessarily telling everybody what it is that the motion is about, right? What is the debate about, okay? Well, providing context would be explaining, like, you know, for each person, regardless of income, what we want to do is we want to make it very difficult for them to own a car. So this means if they're a really rich person and they can drop $100,000 on a car, we're going to make them drop a million dollars on a car, right? If it's a poor person, we're going to make them drop a prohibitive tax would be like, you know, $2,000 on the car. Basically, the context here is that we want a world in which it is very difficult for individuals to own cars, okay? They're going to have to make a very serious financial choice between car or whatever it is else that they want to spend their money on, okay? We're going to limit the options of individuals um, it, when it comes to purchasing a vehicle. Okay, so you're kind of contextualizing, this is what we want the world to look at, this is, the, like, this is the scenario in which we're going to be debating. Okay, so at the end of the definition, it's not that they understand the words of the motion, it's that they can visualize the world in which the debate is taking place. Okay, and this is super important because the worst thing that an opening government can do is provide uh, an unclear debate, like a confusing debate. Okay, and even if they, everybody understands the words in the motion, they don't necessarily understand what the debate is about. Right? So if you bring everybody onto the same table, Everybody knows what we're talking about. At least the debate should be clear. Okay, so think contextualized. Um, don't think definition. Even though I wrote definition, does that make sense? Yeah. And if you guys are, like interrupt me whenever you guys want, um, I'll yell at you. Uh, I'm just getting an answer. Okay. Next thing is problem goal. This is super underrated. There's so many prime ministers or opening governments that don't identify what the problem actually is. Okay. So just make sure. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Here's the problem. There might be more than one problem, um, but you know, here's problem or problems. Um, but just make sure you identify that. A lot of people forget it, and it's it's pretty straightforward. It's a really good way to gain traction around too, because you get to talk about things that are messed up in the world, right? So this is where earlier when I was saying be offensive as a prime minister, this is where you'd be offensive. Okay, so the problem is the status quo, which you're treating as a speaker that came before you. Right? The status quo looks like this, or this person defined this, or said this stuff, and it's messed up for these reasons. Okay? And then on the flip side of that, again, something that people seem to forget is have, an, have a goal. Right? So this is what's messed up in the world. This is our goal to make it, to fix it. Right? We would like for the Syrian refugees to have a place where they are economically viable and also free from uh, being bombed at the same time. Right? Our, our, that's what our goal. Our goal, our goal is to have a society in which they can live exactly as we are living right now. Okay, so that's, that's the goal you can identify. So, um, pretty straightforward, but people forget about it. Um, what this could be is this could look like a model, right? So some um, some motions you do need a model. Some motions you don't. Okay, but um, theoretically the model should be the link between the problem and the goal. Right? This is what is messed up, this is what we're going to do, and what we're going to do is going to achieve for us the goal. Okay? Again, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and don't feel obliged to have a model. You might just, uh, some motions, uh, this house supports environmental um, policy over uh, economic advancement, economic development, does that make sense? Um, it doesn't really need a model, it's more just principle, but you still would want to say like, here's a problem that exists right now, here's our goal. And, you know, by valuing this one thing over this other thing, we will achieve problem to goal. Okay? So you wouldn't need a model, but, um, but and some debates do. Good? Okay. Uh, next thing you're going to have is you're going to have... I'm going to flip. My OCD is killing me. I want this one first, but I don't want to, like, clutter the board up with extra arrows. Okay? So, point of controversy is first. All right? So the point of controversy is this debate is about X versus Y. Okay? It can be really useful to identify that as a prime minister. Um, again, your job is to set up the debate. So if you are identifying what the point of controversy is, 
you're basically introducing the opposition side, so then when they get up and they talk about it, you've set that up. And you've kind of already set the groundwork, right? So the judge is like, oh, that started with the prime minister. If everything that's said in the debate could be traced back to the prime minister, the prime minister wins, period. Okay? So the important thing here on the point of controversy is to be fair about it. All right, don't be, don't try and be like shady. Um, so if, if a motion was um, put up a minimum age for pop stars, we, we, would, we would enforce a minimum age for pop stars. Um, you don't want to be like, well, on Gov, we're going to talk about, you know, we want to protect a vulnerable population. And on opposition side, they're going to say that five-year-olds can make all the decisions for themselves. Okay, that's, that's messed up. So you're not putting a fair burden. Because if you say that, what's going to happen? They're going to say that's not what we're talking about. They're going to talk about something completely different. And you failed in the point of, the, of identifying the point of, controversy, point of controversy, which was to outline what's going to happen in the debate. Does that make sense? But if you're reasonable about it... Um, they're going to say what it is that you talked about, and then you've achieved that goal. Okay? Um, a lot of people get worried here because they're thinking like we're giving arguments to the opposition side, which is great. I mean, it's not a bad thing, again, as opening government. Give them the arguments. You know, A, you've already thought about it, so presumably you have an answer to it. But if B, um, you're not winning the debate from opening government you're, by winning arguments, you're winning the debate from opening government by setting up the round. So if they want to fall into the framework that you've identified for the round, they're giving you the win. Does that make sense? Okay, and again, and it goes back to just clarity. You're making the round so much clearer by laying this out from the very beginning. Okay? Um, ironically, I think that a prime minister's speech is most similar to a, like an opposition whip speech. Okay? So if you're a good prime minister, you've summarized the round before the round has happened. Okay? So you, you outline the round, the round happens in your outline, and then the opposition whip is going to summarize the round. We understand if you both do the job, if you do the job correctly as a prime minister, your speech is going to mirror the opposition whip speech. Okay? And again, if you're a judge and you're saying, did opening government set up the debate, if their speech looks like yours, then that means everything in the round links back to your speech, which means you did your job perfectly, which means you probably won. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Good. You're giving me a face like. No, I'm not no. Sure. Okay. No, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry. No, you're good. You're good. I just want to make sure it's clear. Okay, so that's point of controversy. And then under point of controversy... Um, since we flipped this, right, but I just didn't want to draw extra stuff. Um, we have the philosophy, or it could be called team line. And it's basically going to be your half of the point of controversy, usually. Oh, this yellow, oh, that's a shadow, not a yellow one. I was going to erase the shadow. Um, so it's your half of the point of controversy, right? So again, if it's, if it's, um, uh, minimum age for pop stars, and it would be like paternalism versus X as the point of controversy, your team line would probably be some sort of paternalism, right? Like the government has an obligation to protect these kids from hurting themselves by being pop stars too early. Does that make sense? Okay, so team line is important. Uh, <laughs> the hardest thing, one of the biggest challenges for opening government is just being remembered at the end of the debate. So just being completely honest as a judge, you all talk for like an hour and that's a long time, and sometimes at the end of that, especially like the third or fourth round of the day, it's really hard to remember what the first speaker said. Okay, not for me, but for most judges. <laughs> um, so, no, but uh, yeah, so it is. It is very difficult as a judge to follow every single speaker. So one of the big challenges in opening government is just to be memorable, right? So when the judges are going back over their notes, they're like, "This is exactly what the opening government said," so they can remember and identify you. So having a very clear team line makes it easy for the judge to go back and say, "This is the team that proved for us this one thing." Okay? Um, usually it'll be a sentence, you know, so it, it would be like, if this is paternalism versus X, it would be a sentence that includes paternalism, like I just gave earlier. Okay? Um, a couple of useful things about this is when you're constructing this, the, your case as a whole, it's generally useful for both partners to give the same team line. Okay? It just shows cohesion between the partners, and again, it's just reinforcing the idea like we are this team, we are team X, whatever team line is, okay? Another thing that can be useful is if your case is um, if your case is good, like constructed well, it should be I'm just gonna put team line, and then like argument one, then you should be able to repeat team line, and then argument two, and then team line, and then argument three. You guys get the point, and then team line. Okay, if you have three arguments, uh, meaning that a good case is going to be coherent and it's going to relate to itself. So. Uh, again, I, I'm using basketball. I actually don't know shit about basketball. But I remember a bunch of years ago, um, 
there was like the, the Lakers team, and they had, or I guess the Miami Heat would be a better example now. They had like all the superstars, right? Is that a thing that happened? People that know basketball? They had like three, the three best players in the galaxy ever on the same team. Let's just say that happened. Okay, but they didn't win anything. So you had three amazing arguments or three amazing players, but they weren't coherent together, and so they lost the games to a team that was just solid as a case or as a team. Does that make sense? So having three arguments, even if you had like argument four that you feel like is an awesome argument, but it's totally tangential to your overall case, it can be better to have arguments that are all linked, and every one of these arguments brings you back to the team line. Every, every argument you're making has some element of paternalism tied into it. Right? So you've got one complete, made of steel, indestructible case on opening government, rather than like random points. Because then what's going to happen, especially if you're the PM, they're just going to cherry pick. Like, they're going to drop the one argument, they're going to deal with the other two, um, you're going to get shut out for POIs, and at the end of the debate, you, since you're so disjointed, again, the judges are going to remember you were the team that did this. They're going to just say, like, oh, argument, 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 they're all over the place, and none of them link back to you. You understand? By keeping every argument tied together under the same theme, you make it impossible for the other teams to ignore your case. You're forcing them to engage with your case, and then you're forcing the debate to be about that one thing. So once you've decided that this is the most important thing in the round, if you can bring all your arguments back to that one thing, then you're really defining the round and not letting them cherry pick and then move the round in different directions away from a, a, what might be a really good argument, but just isn't con uh, cohesive enough to force them to stick with it. Good? Okay. Um, it's, not, yeah, it's not to say that you can't have a third argument, but just in general this is going to be better. If you can't think of three arguments on the same thing, that's fine. Okay. Next is going to be motion-specific burdens. Um, and this is, a lot of times, the motion is going to um, burden you with uh, like obvious questions. Okay, So if the motion was, um, this house would pull troops out of Afghanistan, um, what are some obvious motion-specific burdens that would come from that? How? Hmm? How? How, yeah, like when, you know? Um, and, and these are like model but it goes a little bit further than that. It, the easiest way to think of it, I, I guess, that I, I describe it as, is if you're the leader of opposition asking a point of information, what would you be asking? Right? Like, once we're out of Afghanistan, what's going to happen? You know, who's going to take over? There's going to be a power vacuum. How is that going to play out? Like, that's a question that you're going to have to answer. That's a burden that is placed on you by the motion that you're going to have to answer in order to win the round. Does that make sense? Um, it's not necessarily part of your model. Like, you don't have to say, we are going to bring these troops in to replace U.S. troops that are leaving. But instead, you make an argument, when we pull out, this is what we think is going to happen. You know, maybe it could be organically. Again, it's like this, where you don't necessarily need a model. Maybe it's just something that's going to happen. Right? But you do need to identify that thing, whether it's a model or whether it's just an argument um, or just an observation. Okay? But if you leave that open, again, it's super defensive. They're going to attack you on that. Like... What's going to happen? We think it's going to collapse. There's not going to be any power vacuum, blah, 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 blah. And then even if your partner gets up and gives the answers, you guys look super defensive, right? You don't look like you thought of this. You don't look like you prepared for it. You look like you're very reactionary um, instead of proactive. We want to be proactive as an opening government. We want to be on the offensive, not on the defensive. Okay, so the motion-specific burdens um, can be super important. It can be like a make or break um, for an opening government. Like, so if the, if the motion was this house would ban cosmetic surgery, what would the, what would some most motion specific burdens be? Like how you're gonna do it. Okay, and that would be model, right? So that would, that would just, you know, we're gonna make it illegal, throw people in jail or find them if they do it, right? Which is something, you, you need it, but it's not necessarily this. Like it's already been covered, what else? Alternatives? What does that mean? Like. If someone did do it, like how, like they would do it, like illegally, like what would their alternative? Okay, be? so maybe if there's gonna be a black market, if you yeah. think there'll be a black, that might so like I, maybe in a, maybe in an abortion Brandy. debate, that might be something like we we can't stop it from happening, so we're going to have to address like a back alley um, argument. That's something we're gonna to have to address. Um, cosmetic surgery might be like what about um, other things that are similar, like tattoos, or you know what is it about cosmetic surgery that's so unique? that we have to ban it, it's not, um, you know, yeah, versus other things that are really similar to it. Like, without making those distinctions, you, you either have to say, like, cool, we'll ban that also, or you're going to have to identify what's different about that, that would that we wouldn't ban that, but we are banning this. 
Does that make sense? So again, it's, it's think about if you're a leader of off, if you're, if you're putting yourself on the other side and they're thinking of points of information to ask, that's one of the points of information they might ask. Like, why aren't you doing this other thing too that seems exactly the same scenario, right? Um, and, and if you think like to the PM, these are the kinds of questions you get asked, right? Okay, so that would be emotion specific burdens. And again, you're, it's not necessarily that you're going to run away from these things, right? It's not like you've identified a motion-specific burden, and then because you see that burden, you're like, okay, well, we can model the debate in a way that hides us from the burden. It's that if you've identified it, you'll be able to answer and engage with it, and then make the debate better. Okay, like, here is the reason that cosmetic surgery is unique, or, fuck it, we're going to go all out, we're going to ban all these other things also. You know? But again, you're opening up the debate, and you're opening up argumentation, and you're creating clash, instead of hiding from clash. Okay? All right. Um, last thing here, does anybody notice anything that we're missing? From This is our PM speech. Huh? Yeah, there's no arguments, okay? That's fine, we don't need arguments. Um, you, you, can, you can lose every single argument as an opening government and you can still win the debate. Okay, if, if every debater, once the rounds are power matched out, okay, theoretically every team in the room is of equal caliber, make sense? Okay, and if every team in the room is of equal caliber, you say things, they respond to it, they respond to it, they respond to it. You should be losing every single argument by the end of the debate. Okay? Then a four-team format. That's the difference between a two-team format and a four-team format. Okay? And that's why the judges give you credit for setting up the debate. Okay? So if the argument that you've started... Like, you can't just get, like, straight... Just destroyed on every single argument to where, like, you have nothing left. Okay? But the judge can say, I buy this more than I buy this and still give you the first, right? If you're the one that set up that conversation that ran through the round, and the thing that they are trying to disprove in closing off is still this thing that you, like, is, would still be your team line. If they're still identifying your team line as the thing that they're engaging with in closing off, even if they've ended up disproving your team line, you can still get the first from opening government. Uh, and that's the only way that the activity could be fair. Does that make sense? If, if, that was, if the judges didn't give that to opening government, then it would just be impossible for opening government to ever win um, once the tournament got power matched to a certain degree. Like, unless you were just way, the, like, by far the best team in the room, which theoretically by a final should not be happening. Right? Like, four teams should be roughly comparable. Does that make sense? So, um, this isn't to say don't have arguments. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that if you've done the setup correctly, right, if the setup takes five minutes and it only leaves you time for one argument, then we're totally fine with that, for A, that reason, okay? And then the second reason is, there's actually arguments embedded in, in everything we've done so far. Does that make sense? When, you, when you're outlining the problem of the motion, and you're outlining a goal, you're making an argument. You understand? There's something persuasive in explaining the problem and the status quo to the judge, right? You can't tell the judge, like, here's the situation that Syrian refugees are fleeing, and our goal is to get them from that situation to a situation where they can live more like us. There's an argument embedded in that, even if you're not explicitly making argument number one is X. You guys understand that? Um, and then same thing, your team line is going to be an argument. Like, we think that paternalism, governments should act paternally in cases of blah, 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 blah. There's an argument embedded in the team line also. Okay, so you're making arguments throughout the whole thing, and you don't necessarily need to win those arguments to, to win the debate. So structurally, it completely screws up the entire thing if you start saying, like, my first point during your model or during when you're saying the problem. At the same time, do you want to start throwing out taglines on your arguments during that portion if arguments are embedded in there so that they're more recognizable later on? Yeah, you can, but I mean, like, again, and this is, like, I debate differently than a lot of people, but I'm not big on the whole... Tagging. Like, or just debate jargon. Sure. You know, but, um, so, okay, so, I'll get to that in just a second. But does that, does that make sense, guys, on the, on the argument part? Okay. Um, and then the, the last thing is that if um, you're actually going to be making, as a team, so the third thing here is I actually think you're going to be making more arguments at the end of your team using this model where you don't make arguments for the first five minutes <clears throat> than you would if you tried to make arguments as the Prime Minister. What I mean by that is, um, if, you, if you fuck this up, then what's the first four minutes of your deputy speech going to look like? It's going to look like responding to the questions from the leader of op, responding to point of information, what about this thing, you never defined that, I don't understand why this is different, what about in this scenario? So like how many deputy prime minister speeches have you given where you're just like having to rebuild everything that your partner messed up? And in that case, you're not making arguments. You're doing all this work that could have been done ahead of time. 
Okay, so actually if you do this cleanly and they don't attack you on the setup, it frees up your deputy to really start getting engaging in the actual argumentation of the round. So as a team, even if you feel as a PM, this is a bit extreme, as a team, um, it's going to give you guys more argumentation on the table in the long run, and it's all going to be proactive, offensive argumentation rather than retroactive or defensive. Okay, um, and uh, if you'd like proof of this, there's three separate world um, finals. I think I think the only three that opening government have won. Um, the first one was with um, Jeremy Breyer, was from Cambridge, and um, I I would, trained with him for like a week, and he said he he and his partner would spend like 10 to 12 minutes of prep time on the model as opening government, and then three minutes on arguments, right? Because he just understands if you get this correct, the arguments are going to come, right? And as you're thinking of this stuff in prep time, you're also thinking of arguments, even if you're not like flushing them out. And once this is on paper, then the arguments are, are quick, right? So world champion, 12 minutes of prep time on this, and three minutes of prep time on this, right? That's one. And two, in Malaysia Worlds, the first Malaysia Worlds, um, it was Ottawa Law, one from opening government, it was on corporal punishment, and they had a five minute model on literally like the width of the stick they were going to use when they beat the kids, like what this person's position is gonna be, they're gonna be like removed from the room, there's gonna be like a counselor present, I mean like five minutes of model, everybody's like laughing at them, but then they ended up winning because it was just really clear and then they let the debate happen and the partner came through and really impacted all the argumentation. And then the last one I think that I can remember at least the opening of one was in Botswana. Um, it was Victor Finkel, and he uh, was invade Zimbabwe, uh, gave a PM on invade Zimbabwe, and again that one was I think like four and a half minutes on the same sort of setup. So if you want a good example of a, if you want a perfect example, like in my opinion, of a PM speech, you can look that up. So it's Victor Finkel, Botswana Worlds, um, invade Zimbabwe. But that's probably the best um, example of a PM speech that uh, I've seen recorded at least, that you guys can look up, okay? Uh, Alright, so that's that. Uh, then answering Ian's question. So again, I don't like to be very formulaic, and this is obviously very formulaic, okay? Um, you you don't, don't feel beholden to this, alright? If you think, so for example, your team line could also be the problem, or could also be the goal, right? So some of these things can be consumed into each other. So some of these things you could do in one blurb, right? So this could this could take two minutes if the motion calls for that. This could take five minutes if the motion calls for that. It doesn't have to be this order. Like if you feel like um, you want to start with the problem, it's a it's an impactful way to start your speech. Cool. Start with the problem, then get to the definition and contextualization afterwards. If you want to set the framework for the debate up first, go with the contextualization first, right? So feel free. You know, again, if you're, if you're uncomfortable with opening government, you can use this and just kind of follow this and you'll be fine. Um, as you get better at it, feel free to kind of adapt it to A, your own speaking preferences, or also B, um, the, the motion that you happen to be presented with, because that will help these things change. So please don't think I'm like, do this, 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 because I'm not. Okay? I hate that stuff. But um, for, for something that would be useful for you guys less than a week from now, I feel like you know, formula stuff is probably most easily implemented. Yeah. Um, yeah. So another little question about this. If your PM speech is looking like this, mm -hmm. does that mean that your members, or uh, not members, sorry, your uh, deputy speech is going to be a lot of rebuttal then? Because it, it seems like for your, for your second speech, it would be like a lot of reiterative portions, like just kind of... Well, that's, okay, so so the here's the shitty thing about opening up, especially Prime Minister. If you do all these things correctly, you've spent 12 minutes of prep time, 10, 12 minutes of prep time, you've spent 5 minutes of your speech doing all this stuff out, and then if you did it correctly, you'll never hear about it again through the rest of the debate. Like, the actual setup. They're not going to, because if, you, if your model is perfect, they're not going to question it anymore. They're like, okay, cool, we understand what's happening, it's going to work, now we can debate about do we want it to work or not. Right, it's going to go straight to the argument. So... Actually, um, if the point of controversy is correct, they're not going to question you on the framework. It's just they're just going to have that debate. You know, so if you're the deputy prime minister and this is done correctly, you're actually not going to need to. I feel like reiterate or rebuild a whole lot. So it's the arguments. Exactly, because it's going to be clean. So that's when you can be introducing the arguments, um, and they're all going to link back to the setup that you have. Yeah, if you do it right. Any questions on this? No. Okay, so I think. Um, I think we should practice this. So I don't know. I don't know how you want to split them, like either with their partners or yeah, their groups partners. of four or whatever. Yeah. Um, if you want to, uh, if we, we could put like just two partnerships together for groups of four, okay. so that we can. Okay. 
So you guys divide up however you want. I don't care. Could we use the um, Jamaica topics as practice? I want to I want to use them for practice the debates. Oh, those after after that work. Okay. Yeah. So okay. that way we can get a full round on it. Okay. Um, and I, I have some that are good for for this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you guys want to. Okay, so get with your partner. If you don't have a partner, we'll get you one. Just now. But uh, but, uh, practice with Madeline. Practice with Madeline. Yeah, because he's thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah. Practice Madeline. Practice with with Aaron. I was like, I should only like laugh on the telephone here. Okay. Okay, so this 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 takes like I know this thing takes a while to do the first few times through, but as you get better at it, it'll go through faster. So I want to see if we can do. We'll do like a ten minute prep time. You don't need to make arguments. You're just gonna do this, right? So just trying to identify these things, and then we'll have like one of the groups just give this section of a PM speech. Again, it could be like two minutes. It could be I don't care. It could be thirty seconds. You get done thirty seconds, um, up to like five minutes or so, um, and then. Uh, the other teams, we can kind of comment on the choices that were made, okay, and whether we, what we thought was effective and what we thought was not effective, okay? And we'll just do that a few times. Um, uh, let me see. This house would uh, allow individuals to sell their vote. This house would allow individuals to sell their vote, okay? So we'll do like 10 minutes of, um, 10 minutes of prep on that. Okay, listen up, everybody. Thank you. Is he getting seven minutes, five minutes? Uh, however long he takes. So oh, however five, long he takes. Okay, yeah, good. Five minutes is probably what Okay, good. Okay, we're rolling. Panel, the way that our current system works is flawed. The fact that an individual is expected to vote in a democracy, or rather that he is somehow, in, somehow, you know, given the burden that he should keep up with the news, he should somehow be informed, because that's what leads to good representation, that's what gives the government a proper mandate and the accountability that it so desires, is something that we think is incorrect. The current context, or the way that we're going to set up this model, is it's obviously going to have to be in a democracy, right? That's the only place where, vote, where voting happens. So the current system is that you equalize the playing field, right? So it's one man, one vote, regardless of whether or not he's rich, whether or not he's poor, whatever his political views are. You, your idea here is that you get a democratic representation. The problem that we see in this is that you're burdened with the need to make an informed decision, right? We recognize that they may just come up here and say something about how that's only in a compulsory voting system, but we think that even in this system, you only get proper democracy when you get in the votes, right? When you get in the mandates, which is what we want to solve for. We think that there's two real like things that these, this freedom grants you, right? While it's considered a duty, we think that you should have freedom. So we think that there's two main uh, scenarios in which this applies. The first is that you can choose to vote whether or not, right? So it's voluntary. So if you choose not to vote, you get money in return. We think that that's perfectly fine. The second is that su the problem that exists currently is, an act is a matter of convenience, right? That you, do you may not have access to a voting booth. More importantly, though, is like in areas like Phoenix, where you had 108,000 people recently wait um, in line to vote, we think that because of the fact that they're not being given the ability to have their mandate given out to people, we think that this allowing them to sell their vote is somehow better. We think that for both of those kinds of people, for convenience or for just the fact that you do not want to vote, we're perfectly fine to have those people um, do that. The goal then becomes, or what we think is essential in this debate to understand, is that we think that giving people money um, is greater than votes, right? So for example, the reality is that even if you vote, your view is not likely to get um, 
to get you know represented in parliament depending on who you vote with right so if you vote for the australian motorist enthusiast enthusiast party you're not going to have your views benefited because there are other people voting for majority parties that then get to rule right we think that getting money is something that's beneficial to you as a whole and is something that is therefore going to benefit the way that you live your life and the way that you um, are in the system better we think that re voting can be a redundant process essentially because if you're voting with the minority you're not doing anything that's helpful our model is incredibly simple we're going to have an internet transaction through which you have like entities that then buy up your votes right these could be individuals or these could be you know whatever proper organizations that then decide um, that they want to buy a vote. So you obviously have a system wherein you have to fill out all of your information, they transfer you the money, um, be it through a cash, a check, or a bank account transfer, you give um, them your vote. And we think that this allows you to do two things, right? Two things that are beneficial to people who want to sell their vote. One is you get to randomly choose um, whoever, you, whoever gives you the most amount of money. We're perfectly fine with that. If you think that money is what's better for you, you're happy, you can sell your vote and you can do that. Um, fair enough. The second is that you get to vote for entities who align with you, right? So there will be entities out there who say specifically <laughs> who they're going to be voting for, why they're going to be voting for these people. And you then get to say, you know, even though I'm on the fence, even though I don't necessarily want to go vote because I couldn't care less, I think that this makes some sense to me, I'm going to vote for that. We think that that's incredibly, uh, we think that that's better. Um, for all these reasons, incredibly proud of your Thank you. Uh, so what do people, I mean, what do people think? Um, were we able to identify everything from the formula? In the I, I think you, um, there was some that got muddled together. Like, I, I think there were a couple of motion specific burdens that you might have, like, thrown in there that I didn't really see. And also, I don't, I, I think you went, I, I don't think you did contextualization. Like you went straight into model, like, from the very beginning, which. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else? Uh, did, did you have a good short slug line of your team philosophy? No, we didn't. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think like, uh, maybe you should like, uh, try pointing out a bit more on what the possible argumentation against. That would be the fact that it's just like your people are going to be buying, um, you know, kind of like wasting the, your point of controversy about what the opposition is going to say. There's most, I mean, it's pretty obvious when you hear that the opposition is going to say you're just going to start selling it to the highest bidder. And I think, like, maybe point out a bit, you say that you understand that that would be a possibility and that's okay. But I think maybe a bit more on why. Because you could say, like, even though people are going to start spending money on it, the end result would be that it's still going to be a more efficient and more engaged voter base and everybody's better off. So maybe just, like, flesh that out a bit more about why it's okay to end up with, like, people can just pay more for it. Um, what was the problem you guys got? Uh, the idea that you're burdened with the needs. Sorry. Sorry. I wanted, what, what did you guys get? Sorry. Just to see if that way you can see the translation. Sure. See how well you communicated what you thought was the problem to them. Did anybody get what the problem was? Yeah. Um, I, it was a little muddled, but what I got your main problem was was current democracies impose too much of a burden to stay in, to stay informed first and foremost, and second to like actually go out and vote because of long voter lines and what. Mm -hmm. So it, it's burdening people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sorry. Oh, I'm Jared. Uh, I felt like when you were doing your contextualization, you started right out by saying, look, in the current system, that they're not getting what they're voting for anyways, and when they take the time to vote for it, they're not getting the payback. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this so, seemed pretty... Yeah, so what, what did you have as a problem? Um, it was more of the former. The second was sort of an, another point, but I guess that was mm -hmm. part of the problem too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you came back to the problem a couple of different times. Yeah. Like, so I think that just like wasn't organized super well. Yeah, the point of controversy I think is missing. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, what is it? What is, you know, and then like um, Professor Miller was saying, like the philosophy. So then, if the philosophy is half of the point of controversy, that's missing too. I'm not sure how I can summarize you in one sentence. And then, yeah, the motion-specific burdens. I think that they're mentioning, like, you know, obviously the problem is that it's like can be open to abuse. Sure. Like large entities start buying up tons of of um, votes. So something on, are you cool with that, or you know, right. do what do you think we'll check against that, or something along those lines. Um, did did somebody else have a, um, yeah? Did somebody else have a different problem they identified? You guys all identify that same problem. Uh, so I, I identified a different problem, which is that. Uh, Politics is supposed to be a distributive mechanism where your vote translates into some sort of economic agency for you, and that in the status quo, that isn't happening. Mm -hmm. That the majority of people 
find themselves economically worse off, even though they contribute politically. And so if they sell their vote, they can benefit economically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that would probably be more salient to the debate. Just and, and because the things that you're saying are problematic, I think are subservient to that point. And so if voting is supposed to be a way for you to get shit, whatever that is, like principally or economically, whatever, um, the fact that you have to stay informed to do it is undermining that overall problem or goal. You know, the fact that it's inconvenient to do it is undermining the overall problem or goal. Like, if you can't vote, but you haven't told us what the point of voting is, I don't really know why I care that we can't vote. Um, does that make sense? Sure. And then, and then I also think that that one's a little bit more direct to the solution that you have, which is giving them money. Right, so if you think about what you've identified as the problem is staying informed and um, just convenience is what I wrote down. Um, how does giving them money solve staying informed? Or how does it solve the convenience? Right, it's not you, you sure. see like you're, 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 those are like mechanisms to get to something, but you didn't identify the something that we need to get to. So that, that's what I would identify as the problem. Um, yeah, I did like the model bit, and I did like the identifying like you can't either, so like this would be under context, you could either vote with whoever gives you the most money if that's what you want, or you could align with your, like some combination of principles and money. Um, so I did like that bit to give me like a better sense of like how the system would work. Um, uh, yeah, but, but the, the problem I think is the biggest issue there, and then like, yeah, not outlining the point of controversy of philosophy. Sure. And then most of the okay, any other comments on that one? No. Does anybody else want to give that particular one, or do we want to do it again with a different motion? Lydia, you want to try? Do you have something new to add? Did you have a different approach? Uh, it was more or less the same thing, just like how the costs of voting outweigh the benefits. So you did cost benefit now. Yeah. Is anybody substantially different? We are here on April 3rd practicing opening government. Part two of today's tape. Mr. Speaker, we regret the fact that medical advances and medical science moves at a snail's pace when death row inmates' bodies are being wasted and are being derived the utility they could potentially have in terms of saving other people's lives. We think it's a problem in society right now that progress in the field of medical science is stagnant due to a lack of accurate human models to be tested on, the fact that scientists are forced to use animals and incomparable models to develop science which can save human lives. Our goal on this side of the house as the government is to provide accurate human models for those scientists and to develop medical science which is going to help humanity. We think we're going to do that by providing the bodies of death row inmates to these uh, like medical scientists in terms of developing the science that we think is going to be beneficial. In terms of the model, we think it's fairly straightforward. We think this involves testing uh, both during the time that death row inmate is alive, as well as the body after that death row inmate has uh, you know, had their death sentence um, e executed. Uh, in terms of the point of controversy, we think that the clash in this debate is about whether or not death row uh, inmates maintain a, a level of bodily autonomy that warrants them you know, being tested on or not being tested on. And on the government side of the house today, we strongly believe that the extent to which their rights to bodily autonomy are already violated means that the state is perfectly justified in using their bodies for testing, which is going to be beneficial to society. Uh, proud, to propose, uh, proud to propose. Okay. Um, stay, you want to stay up there? Okay. Stay up there. Um, so, okay, do, do we see anything missing? No? Maybe just uh, as far as a model of like what this would actually look like. I mean, I think you do a good job of saying like, you know, their rights to bodily autonomy are already violated, but like, are we going to give these death row inmates Ebola and like just watch them like twitch around in pain and then like try out all these different invasive maneuvers or like just kind of what does this look like? Dr. Mengele. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, like I think you, I think there was some motion specific burdens you could have thrown in there. Like, like was, are we going to experiment them on, on them indefinitely for 10 years? Are they going to be stuck like doing all this, all this kind of stuff? I think that's stuff that would have gotten brought up later, so it was important to address it um, early on. Okay, so how do we, um, how would you guys answer, like, so we, we, you've got a choice here. The other thing is, um, the motion, a lot of teams, I don't know if it's the right way to do it, but a lot of teams would um, put a choice into the model, like death row inmates could opt in or opt out of this. Um, the motion doesn't necessarily say, like, 
you know, you could, if you gave them a choice, you would still be using death row inmates, right? I think it's a bad way to debate, but um, some, many, many, many teams would do this, okay? Um, so that might be something you want to clarify from the beginning, like, as soon as you're convicted of death row, we are going to be using you, you have no say in it, yeah. or you could opt in or opt out of it. So that would be a motion-specific burden also. So the, but the, yeah, the, the, the point of all of these, the point of all of these, and this would be a kind of, kind of a contextualization thing, is how extreme of a policy is this going to be, right? So, um, and there's no right or wrong answer for this, so like different people here might feel more or less comfortable um, making it more or less extreme. Um, the important thing to understand is like what the trade-offs are. Okay, so if we make it a less extreme policy that says maybe they could choose to do it, and we're only going to be doing things that have already been approved for human testing, and you know, like lean in that direction. What's the trade-off for that choice? You lose like um, a lot of this argument about like advancing medical knowledge, and um, also like why would people opt in? You know, so you, you kind of lose all that class. So, so you do lose. You lose you efficacy. Lose the, the softer it is, the less effective. So it feels like easier to defend on the rights level. But, it's, but you get less efficacy out of it, and if you go more extreme with it, you're going to have to do more work on the rights analysis, and, but, you, but you're also going to get a lot more efficacy out of it. So, again, um, if I was debating, uh, I would be on this end of the spectrum, where I'd get shit done. Um, I'm just comfortable making those kinds of arguments. Um, it's not to say that being on the other end of the spectrum is a, is a bad choice if you're more comfortable with that, but the point of all that is, you do need, so this is under definition, the reason I would put contextualization is you would want to contextualize what type of procedure we'd be talking yeah, about. Um, yeah. So, would, would it be like appropriate to say it's like an extra sentence on top of like death row? Like not every death row inmate is like sentenced to be like experimental time, like only like kind of the most heinous. Like it would be like giving you. Again, I guess, but yeah, that's another choice. You know, it, it, would, it would definitely soften mm -hmm. the case. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily illegitimate, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, do we have a clause or something in this model about the appeal system? How uh, only after failing to be, I mean, only after they are not successful at appealing their mm -hmm. sentence to be reduced, do they yeah. then qualify for experimentation? Yeah, like when they're for sure going to get killed. Yeah. Like appeals are done, right? Unless Schwarzenegger calls in the last minute, like, you know, with the pardon. And, yeah. Um, so another thing that we saw was that, uh, about the fact that like, how long is the punishment on them, and kind of like going off the entire choice aspect. So could we like if you say something like, oh they have a choice in it, but like they get something out of it for a return. So it's, so say it's like if they opt in, they get experimented on for like say for six months, and then they guarantee that that's when the death penalty will be carried out, so they don't have to wait for like 17, 20 years. Sure. So could you like if you yeah. do that, does that like harm our organization? That is like we're trying to like make. It like you're essentially trying to make a bargain with the person right. on death. But that's, um, yeah, again, uh, like A, it would cut into your bodily autonomy stuff that he was he's saying. Like, so if he's saying, like, you lose the right to bodily autonomy, you would just make the choice. Um, but yeah, so if you were going to have a choice, then you take on the burden, it's an extra burden of how do we get them to agree to it, and then you would need to give them some sort of incentive. So you see, like, the choices you guys make put more burdens on your case or remove burdens from your case. So as long as you're understanding, like, what those burdens are, then you can make an informed choice, and then when the other teams start asking these questions, you have the responses to them. But that's really the important thing about this, is you identifying, these are the things I need to cover, okay. so you don't get like surprised by it, and have to try and answer it in the middle of your speech on the POI, and then probably say something stupid, and like lock you guys into a horrible position. All right. um, so, yeah, and, and so you don't, so it, you do need to get specific enough to contextualize, but we don't want to be overly specific. So I think in this case, it's kind of like, you, you know, you would want to tell the judge, like, the balance we are drawing is, you know, um, we're forcing them into something that we've decided is okay for humans, right? So we're going to force them into it, but it's it's for procedures that have been approved for human testing, right? So that could at least gives us a sense, a context of these are the sorts of procedures. You don't have to be like, here's the eight things we're allowed to do, and here's the twelve things we're not allowed to do, you know. Or if you want to go crazy with it, you could say things that haven't been approved for human testing yet. Um, we're going to use them for that because, you know, if it's been approved for human testing, then civilians, we can use them, they're opting in. Like, there's people that have cancer already that would like to be tested on, we'll use them for that. But we're talking about things that need to cross the gap between animal testing to human testing. So, again, whatever answer you want, but you understand these things are at least telling everybody in the room, like, cool, this is what we are debating. So instead of debate, like, what the conversation we're having right now would literally be the debate. 
you know, what about this? What about that? Well, if that's what you're going to do, then you need to do this other thing. It's just a shitty debate to have. Right? So if you clarify this stuff in the beginning, then you don't have that debate. You have the real debate, which is just the arguments of should we do this thing? Now that we all know what it is. Okay, so that would be the only thing. Just a little bit clear on the, um, the degree to which you're doing things. But the rest of it I thought was good. Thank you, sir. Okay.